and Ben told the boys, like, I just, no matter what happens, I want you guys to show the world what Fiji rugby is all about. He's so dangerous, Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dan and Stanford, and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens international. Back in my playing days, I went head to head against Dallin and the USA. For several years, Robin has coached international Sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDowell rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Oh, it's more dangerous than climate change. Welcome to episode five. It's Fijian legend Osir Kalinasau that joins us this week. And as we're going to start off all our new episodes, let's first catch up on how we know the guest. Robin, what have your interactions been with the great man known as Oscar? Obviously, uh, no, no, Oscar. I say a from the from the rugby trail uh, for a number of years, and then uh, most recently had an opportunity to catch up with him when I was uh, Woodlands Woodlands Rugby Club in in Houston, Texas. Brought me down after uh, after a good week in uh, Dallas, Texas, with the Gorilla, Gorilla Rugby Academy, and uh, had a few days off before we kicked off the weekend camp. And Jose and I grabbed a coffee at a nice little coffee shop in Southern Houston, and uh, we spent a couple hours together. And I just wanted to you know full circle share with him uh, how inspirational the Fiji. Um, road to the the Olympic Games and the gold medal, how that impacted um, rugby Mexico's road to qualifying to the World Cup and going to the World Cup. And uh, I, you know, I guess a shout out to Ben Ben Ryan as well. I read or listened to the audio book on my travels, and that was really my only medicine as a, as a traveling coach um, and just being solution oriented. But uh, but yeah, I just wanted to thank him and just kind of share how how much he impacted essentially a nation. Uh, a foreign nation like Mexico. And, uh, and then it was just so humbling to hear from him that he was so proud of our Mexican women. He was just following them when they qualified for the world cup. And he said to his wife and he told me that, um, although he was an Olympic gold medal champion, which is the highest you could ever win in sevens or in rugby, um, that his goal was ultimately to go to a rugby sevens world cup. So it was really interesting to, for him to share that with me and, uh, and, and just de- dive into our story so he's overcome so many different challenges in his life and um and he's just such a humble guy so as i said to you dal like we got to get him on and we got to get his story out there to share with the world so it was wonderful how about you when did you first uh connect with oscar i tried to tackle him on the sevens world series unsuccessfully so for a few years uh but then rob and i got a chance to at least commentate uh he, when he played on the series 2015 2016 before the olympic games and i'll never forget uh they fiji Uh, dramatically won the USA Sevens in Las Vegas uh, in 2016, just before the Olympic Games. And I got a chance to do the post-tournament interview for World Rugby Fieldside. And he was so humble and sending a message out to all his his fellow family and all all the folks in Fiji because they're just ravaged with uh, hurricane on that side. Um, just just such such a nice such a nice gentleman, of course, representing our sport. And then more recently, got a chance to commentate him on the um, Major League Rugby event here in the US for the Houston SaberCats. Catch up with him here and there, and those old legs of his they can still go, my friend. Even at the Rugby Town Sevens, uh, he's carving it up. You know, so what so what a great man. Uh, but those switching switching gears, uh, let's catch up on our current day life uh, right now. Uh, what have you been up to the last week or weekend, my friend? Yeah, well, it was meant to be my my wedding uh, this week here. So uh, we have family Congrats. in town, we have friends in town. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, so we'll we'll get you out to the West Coast in a year from now. But uh, so just been doing a bunch of fishing because I was meant to go fishing with my buddies, and and obviously being back on the West Coast here, and and one of my fishing buddies, one of my groomsmen, Andrew Goodman Seth, who's one of the best pirates on 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 the on the Wild West Coast, took me out about fifty miles, and uh, we were into salmon. I think we had seven or eight uh, wild Pacific salmon on the boat before eight a.m. And uh, so it was it was great to kind of unplug a bit, and then. Uh, that I, I had an opportunity to head out fishing with uh, my my cousin Mike McDowell and uh, and his little boy Hugo, who's a rising McDowell rugby star, five years old. So uh, halfway through the day, um, our family are big Blackhawks fans. Uh, the the owner and operator of, of Sturgeon Slayers, he uh, he dialed up uh, Duncan Keith, 
and uh, who's his best friend, obviously Chicago Blackhawk legend. Um, he's currently in a hotel in the, in the NHL bubble in Edmonton and called up my little nephew who's five and uh, gave him a, a belated happy birthday and a, put a two, three minute shout out. So that was a pretty special day. Oh, that's epic, my friend. As I said, I saw it online going absolutely viral. Uh, just an all around brilliant, brilliant uh, story to share, you know. Yeah. How about you? What have you and uh, Verity been up to the last few weeks here? Yeah. So since we start the podcast, we haven't done this sort of regular update, which we will moving forward, but we moved from Los Angeles to Boston or just south of Boston, a little town called Westport. We've already grew up. We're really enjoying the outdoor life. And um, while we aren't fishing as much as you, we're just getting down to the beaches and we went for a nice 20 mile uh, bike ride the other day, which is good fun. And then uh, for some reason, Verity needed to get a bit more content on social media. And so for, she started sculling my beers on Sunday when I was having a little braai outside, a little South African braai. I'd put my beer down, turn around to do something else, and there she was, downing it. Um, she obviously came down faster than me. She's a real Zulu warrior, but uh, up to no good as always, you know? Yeah, well, you're going to have to start hiding your beers on her or drinking faster. <laughs> exactly. Jeepers. Uh, and then let's talk about this week, my man. What, what do you got going up in, uh, in your neck of the woods? Well, a little bit more holiday, and I got the in-laws in town from from the Canadian prairies, and uh, we're heading to the West Coast. I'm going to get some surfing in, so trying to live that West Coast uh, life uh, while I can with no rugby here. How about you guys? Oh, that's wonderful to see, man. Yeah, also, not not too much on the go. Uh, one event I'm working on is the re-airing of the 2019 Rugby Town Sevens, and so that's really cool. They're going to air all three days of the tournament, and then um, we're going to do some interviews between the block of four matches each, and it's really cool because I get a chance to feature yourself, um, you know, coach who basically put the notepad down and ran into the field and scored a brilliant try. So we get to have a bit of fun with you and a bunch of other legends, including Osir Kalanasau is on there. And then one of my all-time favorites, the mullet man, makes a massive appearance. Uh, he's uh, he's a special kid. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with him with the, the Canadian Pathway uh, Sevens program. But for him to have a breakout tournament at 19 years old, to have, obviously he he decided to grow a mullet and bleach it just in time for, uh, I mean, that that's just fish shooting fish in a barrel for, for down Stanford. So I can't wait to relive, uh, relive issue with carving up, uh, these legends. Oh no, it's uh, it's really a, a real highlight. I'm actually nervous to interview him. You know, he's a, he's, he's a big fish in my world. Um, let's finish off with a couple of thank yous. Um, I just want to give a shout out to a friend of mine uh, called Jeremy Castro. We played rugby together in Los Angeles at the Occidental All Boys. He owns his own apparel business, and then in recent times, he switched across and made turned his t-shirts into making masks and donated thousands to the local hospitals there in uh, Oakland, California. Uh, just, a, just a great man doing wonderful things. Uh, his company is called Brand Marinade, and he wants to give a shout out as well to a fellow hooker that has played rugby for many years in the U.S. called Chris Babshis, who runs Rugby Athletic. So if you need any swag, go to him. And he specifically said, hookers on the field supporting hookers off the field. Actually, no, that's probably not his words. It's hookers supporting hookers. Uh, and then another thank you I want to give out is to Lee Tynan from uh, Gilbert Rugby Canada. Uh, they've been absolutely brilliant for, for us, you know, helping with our logo, helping spread the word of the rugby hive and just doing brilliant work. Yeah, and I just want to give a shout out to uh, Kevin Estrada again from the Sturgeon Slayers on, uh, on, on the Fraser River out of Hope, BC. If you ever get to the west coast of Canada and you want to do some some river fishing, uh, he's a, he's a ex big time hockey player and just, just the most class guy you ever meet, but we got to reel in uh, a fish that was seven and a half feet long Dallin, and my back is still wrecked. So, um, but yeah, what, what an experience. And, uh, just want to give him a shout out. So cheers, uh, Kevin. And make sure to catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive on Twitter and Facebook and at My Rugby Hive on Instagram. And we're on Anchor and you can get our weekly podcast there. Without further ado, it's episode five. Today's guest is the most Capfordian Sevens player of all time. With 62 tournament appearances on the HSBC World Rugby Sevens Series, he is the all-time second highest scorer for Fiji with 1,272 points behind the King of Sevens, Wasali Serevi. His Sevens accolades are unrivaled, captaining Fiji to back-to-back -back World Series Sevens titles and an historic gold medal at the Olympic Games, the first ever medal for his small island nation. Here is Fijian legend Osir Kalanasau. That's lekker. That's lekker, as we say in Afrikaans. <laughs> so we switch from Afrikaans, we switch to Fijian. It's Bola. Thank you very much for coming on uh, the Rugby Hive today, my friend. Thank you for having me, man. So how are you holding up that side and, and, and how are things going in Houston? Yeah, things are pretty well, uh, considering what we're going through right now and uh, We've been staying 
Safe at home uh, with my wife and son. It's hard when you have a little one you who know, wants to get outside and has a lot of energy and just running around the house. But everything's been good and uh, we've been sticking to the guidelines and hopefully we're over with this COVID-19 soon and we can get back and uh, enjoy what we do most and, you know, get back to rugby. Yeah, we all hope so, don't we, you know? So speaking about running around as a little one, um, can you share your childhood memories of where you grew up and uh, and how you were introduced to the sport of rugby? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in uh, Suba, Fiji. And, they, you know, Fiji are crazy about rugby. And I actually started playing uh, football in school, growing up at primary school. But then I switched when I got to high school because... High school I went to was my brother's high school. He convinced me to join his high school and and they only played rugby. So I switched to rugby there and, um, you know, growing up, rugby's always around me. All my friends played uh, at home and playing touch every afternoon. So I was just in a matter of time to really just focus all my attention into rugby and give it a try. And I was lucky enough to be out of a thousand kids in Fiji get to represent Fiji and get scouted by Serevi and things just pick up from there. That's a pretty, pretty epic recruiter, I bet, as a young man. Uh, when you were growing up and first started playing, what were some of your rugby dreams and amb- ambitions as a, as a young Fijian player? Oh, uh, as a young Fijian player, my, my dream was always to, to play in a rugby World Cup Sevens. That was one of my dreams because I, I remember sitting down in front of the TV at 97 when Fiji first won it and I seeing Serevi play and seeing Mana Sambari. You know, after they finish the World Cup and they play the Rugby Union song and, you know, seeing Mana Sambari run down the touch and they play that song. Like I always imagine myself walking back from school just, okay, I'm on the sideline now. I step in one and it was always, you know, I was like, I hope, hopefully... I get to play in a, in a World Cup, and that was always my dream to play in a World Cup in sevens for Fiji. Yeah, when we, we caught up uh, earlier last summer when I was down in Houston, you'd mentioned, it uh, blew me away that, you know, your goal was to go to a Rugby World Cup. And I guess back then, you know, obviously rugby wasn't in the Olympics. And for me, you know, the ultimate would be to go to an Olympic Games and to win a gold medal. And uh, that's something you did as a, as a Fijian. But uh, uh, you, you're still your your goal is to go to a World Cup. Yeah, uh, that was my goal, and I've I've always said that I never dreamt of being in the Olympic, like never in my wildest dream. I was like the closest that we ever get to the Olympic in Fiji was me and my mates just imagining that. Oh, okay, you take in the streets. I be Usain Ball. I be I be green, and we're running, and we do relays on the road, or. We'll go and say, oh, let's do some javelin and see who gets it. Or we do go to the to the water or the pool and like, I'll be Michael Phelps, you be Pop. And, you know, it's like just imagine those kind of things like, oh, we're in the Olympic. And I've never imagined that I'd be in an Olympic, let alone winning a medal. And, you know, it was just, it was huge. I just, my goal was always the whole Rugby World Cup and to play in an Olympic, you know, that super series that. But sometimes I still pinch myself to remind myself like why oh, won't I won't go in the Olympic. Yeah, I, I I did that. So, you know, it still still gets to me when you think about what you've done, but it's still so unreal. When you see sports person that we've gone to the Olympic, like oh they were Olympic. They they participated in this Olympic. They are Olympic champions. And I was like, so I'm I'm an Olympic champion. Like it's still unreal when you think about that and so I think that supersedes being in the World Cup. But yeah, I, I really, really wanted to make my World Cup dream come true. But it was unfortunate that I missed out on three World Cups. Two on injury and one on selection. So. But still, you give us goosebumps talking about the Olympic Games because you're right, as any athlete or fan watching the Olympics is the ultimate. And so we'll get back to that in a second. Let's first talk about, as you said, you're a younger player. You get scouted by Wasali Sarevi, the great master himself. But then, what is your journey or pathway like to then represent Fiji on the Sevens World Series? Um, so, I started out like, I just finished high school. And uh, I was starting out in uni. And I get, we played, there's a super series that was played in, uh, in the capital in, uh, 
in Suva. And I played in that Super Series. I was like, I was so young, just like a scorn little 19 year old, fresh from high school. And the name came out. And my dad said, Oh, you've made the capital side. So it's huge to make the capital side because the likes of Serevi, Marika Vunimbaka, Setefano Takao, and all these big names. So my dad said, your name, your name came out on the squad, the capital side squad. And I'm like, Oh, the development squad? Yes. And my dad said, No, your name is not in the development, it's in the main squad. I said, What? So on the first day of trading, me and my dad pull up and my dad gets to drop me. And I look to the ground and I see Serevi there, Marika Bunimbaka. I see Serafano the cow. I see all these big names that went for Fiji. So I just told my dad, let's just get picking the car and go back home and uh, I won't get, I won't have a chance, you know? It's like, I don't have a chance. I was so, just looking at those guys, their names and everything. I was like, oh, there, I won't have a chance. I'll just play for development. So let's just go back home. And my dad was just sat there. He's like, just go and train. Just be you, train. You won't lose nothing. Just go and train. So I went and I started training and that year I started studying starting for the capital side and I played with Serev. He's like, I'm, I'm lucky to have played with him in 15 then, you know. He's always telling me like, Oscar, you're young, make sure don't go into contact, step them, give the ball to the big guys. <laughs> Those guys, I don't know. I was like, okay. And after one year with the capital side, the next year he was coach for Fiji and he just came up and he said, Oscar, uh, there's a, I'm starting a, a rugby sevens team called the Suva Eagles if you wanted to join. And he said, I think you'll be good at sevens. So I said, okay. So I joined the Eagle squad and November came around and he wasn't coach yet and he was still playing, but then he took the South Sea Drifters to Dubai. And he said, Oscar, I want to take you to Dubai with me, but we'll play for the South Sea Drifters and we played along with that. Now, all of those guys that I played with were all sevens international for Fiji and I was the only young one. And... On my first trip, I just stuck with him. Whatever said, my dad was like, you listen to Serevi. Whatever he says, you do so. Wherever Serevi went, I went as this youngster just following this guy's side. So we played and, and we won the Inter Invitational in Dubai. And we were in the fun with Dan Norton's team from England. I still remember, I was like, because I saw this young, young, young youngster on that side too, playing wing, and I'm this side playing wing. So that's when I first saw Norton. I was like, oh. So, and the following year in Dubai, he said, Roscoe, I'm going to get you in the team, man and see how you go from there. And I said, okay. So that's how I got into, started with Sevens with Serbia and Fiji. So, so let's quickly go back. Who, who won the battle between you and Norton back then? I, I think we won because we won the final. So. <laughs> good, good. We'll tell him you shredded him from, from what, 19 years old. Um, so let, let's fast forward. Um, what, tell us about uh, where did you make your actual debut on the Sevens World Series and tell us about that weekend. You know, what was going through your mind and, and what do you remember about that, uh, that initial debut? Of, uh, so I debuted in uh, Dubai 2008. So my debut was against USA. And it was just, uh, I was nervous, but really excited. I wanted to see, you know, how it would feel. And I was so excited when they named me the squad. They said, like, Oscar, you're on the top. It's going to represent this week. And Celeb said, uh, you're going to be coming from the bench. And we had the likes of Moneva, and Moneva was, was the starting wing. So leading up to that week, I was just so so nervous but excited. And I was like trying to tell myself that if I get my chance, I need I really need to take this opportunity. And I was sitting on the bed just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then Jerry said, Oscar, you're in half time, half time. And like one minute into half time, Oscar, you're in. And I was lucky enough, like first ball I got, I just, I scored from my first ball and I scored two tries on my debut. And that was huge for me. And, you know, I couldn't wait to go back home and call my dad and say, you know, I'm so happy. Like now I'm settled that I've scored and I can get started. That's amazing memories. Cause I do remember trying to tackle you both those times you got through and um, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough stopping you. I'll tell you what, my friend. So in a way you got me to thank for your two tries. <laughs> now, I, I think I got to thank the big guys because I played with some of the guys in that seven season. I was small, but I was lucky enough that they just passed the ball and I was in the right place. So I was lucky to play with some of the talented guys that were there and really lucky to have Sherevi as, as a coach and mentor. And just uh, just fast forwarding a bit, um, can you share some of your stories about uh, working with Ben Ryan, his transition to Fiji and how you both connected, which eventually led to you becoming the captain? 
Yeah, so uh, my first lesson of Ben, because I always pass him in the series when he coached for England, I always say morning, I say morning, then walk past him. Then I walk past him, I say morning, and sometimes he'd say morning, sometimes he'd be, he wouldn't say, oh, I was like, this guy doesn't like to talk to me. And I, you know, I, my point is like, this guy doesn't like, maybe this guy's arrogant. To me, that, that I was, how it was, because sometimes he'll just be in his world. But when I got to know him, it's like when he's focused on something, like he's always thinking, his brain is always working. And I was like, oh, so that's why he's, he was like, he'll be sitting and you think that he's just drinking coffee, but his brain is just thinking, like going through what to do next. How can I go around this one? How can we go around this one? How can we tackle this play like? Like getting to know him and somebody's like, why, why is he successful as a coach? And I was like, he's just very smart. Like, I was like, he's just a really smart guy. Eh? A really smart coach on how he goes about things. And so I get this call from the board. For, they said, uh, how would you feel like, I went into the, with the board members in Fiji Rugby then, and one of them asked, how would you feel like I'm having a, an overseas coach? I think, so I told them, I think that that would really, really help us. I think in a way, like we go out, we try something new because it's always been local guys given the job. So I was like, you know, it wouldn't harm us trying out something new, getting a fresh new, fresh new face and how they go about things. So they said, okay. And after maybe a month or two, you get this announcement that Ben Ryan is his coach. I was like, oh, this is huge. So I had a, I had a falling out with the coach in Derry. I don't know, but when Ben came in, he said, oh, is Colin South still playing? And he said, yeah, he's still playing. And he said, okay, I want him in the team before he comes to Fiji. That's before the goal course. And for some reason, Ben said, for some reason, your name wasn't in the team. So, because the coach in Derry selected the players. And he came in and we had a, a tournament in Fiji, a Fiji water tournament. And I managed to play. I played for the Fiji Barbarians then. So I ended up playing. And they, had, they already had selected the team for Gold Coast. And Ben just came in and uh, to overlook that tournament and he was going to take the team to Gold Coast. So in the tournament, one of the boys got injured. But it's already in the squad. And I must have played good in that tournament. And after the tournament, that Ben walked up and said, hey, I said, Mbula, I'm Ben. I said, oh, Mbula. And he said, how would you feel like going to Gold Coast? And I, I was like, I wouldn't mind at all. <laughs> and he said, okay, you're in. So that's how we first started and we first got to know each other. And then our relationship just started out from there and really getting to know him and his philosophy of coaching and where he likes to be redundant. He teaches something that he said, you know, he said, I like it when I come and I don't have to do coaching and I see players doing these things instead of coaching. He said, I just sit back and I just watch. And he said, that's when I know that my job is completed. I don't have to do this. And then I see you players just taking it on your own and you're coaching yourself. So, yeah, I pretty like to meet someone like him and to learn under him and to learn to play and to pick his brains and to see how... He goes about things and, you know, I really like our time and we go as a coach and captain and we play golf and we'll discuss things and, and to see how this guy's brain just ticks and the way he thinks about himself. And the, the scary thing about it, on our road to Olympic, we were just scratching the top line. And I'm like, what if we had this guy for another four years? And, you know, whoever gets him and wherever he is, like, they will be really lucky. And I hope that one day I can coach against him. And you know, being exposed to that type of level of coaching, and that, that's my dream now, that one day I can do that to the place that come in when I coach. And, you know, the mark that he has set, and uh, that's a dream. And I said, I hope I get to coach against him one day if he's still coaching. <laughs> So uh, you were part of an unbelievable era for Fijian rugby, going back-to-back -back series titles in 2015 and 2016. Can you tell us a bit about what made those two years so successful for your country? Uh, ben, when I said like, people say that, oh, because Fiji, Fiji had the talent already. Some people, they don't credit him with, with what he did with the team. They said, oh, anybody can do that. Anybody can go coach. I was like, 
I'm like, no, you guys didn't know what was happening inside. Like, the planning is something else. You can have the talent, but the planning, the coaching. Like, one thing about Ben, if he plans something, like, it's six months, he's already planned it, it will go according to what he planned. Like, like Garden, he said, like, according. He made sure that it went. Like, that was something scary about him. He's already, his mind is like, okay, what if this goes wrong? Like, he's got that covered. Six months. We want this. We want that. So, people back home, I always find it that when people say, oh, anybody can coach Fiji and win. Like, he was lucky to, he was lucky to have the boys with him. And I was like, no, like, we were lucky to have Ben. And, you know, on our two years, one thing was just like, Fiji was known for inconsistency, high tackles. Like, when he came in, like, we had the least number of yellow cards. Uh, we were one of the consistent team. Although, although we might lose a tournament, but we topped the rate in turnover and kickoff in line out, receiving, like, you know, and his mind always like, hey, when we be down, like, oh, we lost in the same fun. He's like, hey, Oscar, why are you done? Like, we still top these things. We top the turnover. We top the try scoring. We top, like, we still good. It's just bad decision. And, and those kind of little things, like, those kind of little things and you do appreciate that you get it from him and people don't see that but I was lucky enough to be in and you know I've always, when people say oh no Fiji had the talent and had everything I was like no if it wasn't for Ben like the planning and his mind it was something that just added to the flair we had and one thing about him like he didn't want to take out the Fijians in us he wanted like I want it to be brought out so the world can see you know instead of changing us people think oh he would change and like no because other Fijian coaches, I was like, why couldn't other Fijian coaches do this? We had to have a white man come in. And he just brought out the real Fijian in us. I was like, what's wrong then? With, with him, it was just transparency, doing things with honesty and kindness, and make sure you're a man of your word. And that was it. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I mean, su- su- such a such a kind and wonderful coach as well. So when, when, when people think, when fans think about rugby sevens, they think about Fiji straight away. And you, hit, you spoke about that, you know, four titles in the World Series out of 20 seasons. Fiji have won only four. You were part of two of those. Can you talk about how competitive the series is and how difficult it is to win a series title? Man, like every year the series gets, gets tougher. People don't remember. Like, now you see, like when I compare it back then, I was like, now faster stronger even the forwards faster and stronger and you gotta be a total rugby player to play sevens you gotta be able to run fast you gotta be able to step you gotta be able to tackle you gotta be able to kick and it's changing all of the time and you have players that are coming in six foot seven foot that are really fast and really skillful and offload and it gets really tough like you don't know who might win in the day in sevens. That's what I like about saying, like, South Africa can be number one contender, but they just get knocked out. Like, every game, now when you watch sevens, every game is a final for every team. You can't just, like before, oh, we're just going to walk through, keep this place. You have to play your A place every game. So you must make sure that you have 12 A players so you can squam them, you know, you can change them around. And that was one thing we did. Like, we were lucky enough to have 12 players that could all start. And that made a difference. And Ben made sure that we had that, that we had 12 players that could all, all could start and competing. And every team is getting to that point where they have 12 players that all can start a seven. And the coach just needs to pick his seven. And whoever comes in lifts the game up. And, you know, when leaving it now, but seeing the competitiveness of the game and seeing how fast it's growing, like, I kind of miss it. And I was like, I don't know, maybe it'll be tough to go back because it's just, it's just fast. Now it's wasn't, it's getting faster. Players are getting faster and stronger. Just advice to people who want to get into sevens, like you got to be really fit to get into sevens. Like these players are insane and the work, work they go through in a day, in a week, it's just, you know, it's just insane. And I talk about it with the boys in, in Houston. They said, oh, Oscar, what do you guys do for fitness? Like, I'm like, if I, if I tell you, like, you, you'd want to die, like, the fitness we do every day. And seven, like, seven players are one of the toughest players. And they're going to be strong mentally, and their training is just on another level. Can you take us back to, uh, to Cyclone Winston and how that affected your family, your country, and ultimately your team? Yeah, 
I was lucky enough. My family when when affected, they really stayed at the capital, Itinera, but most of the boys are from the western side. And some of the boys, um, one of the boys, Al- Alfred Vitokani, is playing for London Irish now. That he had, he had to walk uh, three kilometers to just find to come into camp to find a car to bring him into camp, bring a bus. He said, I had to walk with his bag and come into camp. And uh, Pio's house was destroyed, uh, half of the kitchen taken out, and some of the other boys there, they said their roof was shaking. And so we, we march into camp and we're there with Ben. And he looks at us and, you know, normally we come into camp on a Monday and we'd have fitness test, yo-yo test on four o'clock every Monday. So we came into camp and Ben just had a look at us and he said, there's no training today. You guys go rest, sleep. And he said, you know, when I see you guys, I could see in their face worried, and, you know. And he said, we won't train today. Just go sleep properly. I know you guys didn't have good rest, good sleep. So on a Monday, we'll give you time off, sleep properly, enjoy, have a proper meal at the hotel. And then on a Tuesday, we started and, you know, he just reminded us, like, hey, we are the first one of the selves to bring smiles back into these people's faces in, uh, in Fiji. You know, you know, you guys know how you, they love rugby. And he said, one thing can cheer them up is if we do this for them. We win this and it'll bring smile to their faces. And you now we went to Vegas and we won against Australia. And I don't know, like, again, like the wind was really strong in that Vegas tournament. <laughs> and uh, we were down and Luckily, we came back and won the Vegas tournament. And to see, you know, people with damaged houses still watching TV and cheering, like it gets you so emotional. Like these guys, are, they love rugby so much that they don't care like what's happening right now. They just want to watch their team. And you know, some of them sitting in front of TV and just watching with no roof, or they taking the TV up to a hill to try and watch it. And you know, to get smiles on their faces, it speaks volume of what are we playing for and who are we playing for as a, as a team. And, you know, we were thankful that we got the win and we got it for the, especially for the people of Fiji that were suffering at that time. Yeah, Oscar, I remember being on the field after you won. I interviewed you straight after that victory and I could see the emotion pouring out of you. Uh, and you and you gave a message to your family and friends and everybody watching there. And, um, you know, going back to that time, as you said, uh, everybody in Fiji is tuning in to watch. I mean, you must have felt at least really proud you could play your part. Yes, well, I, I was really, even the boys, we were proud when we went back and, you know, we looked at each other and changed them and we were happy and we said, like, you know, we did, we did something good. We, did, we, brought, we brought smiles to people's faces in, in midst of, you know, helplessness and, you know, people that don't have much, houses destroyed, like, we were able to give them something to smile about, you know, something positive where they know, like, oh, we can still do this, we can overcome this, like, you know. The boys are out there, family suffering, and they play and they win and, you know, gives them hope that, okay, we can do it. If the boys can do it, we can do it. So there's something big and, you know, I'm so proud of the moment that we were able to do it as a team for our country. Uh, We talked about it a bit last year and I know in in Ben's book, but in that week leading up, didn't you guys arrive a a few days late and, and some of the boys were sick from the water and so... You know, you, you guys sounded like you had a lot of things to overcome in the lead up to, to that cup final. And, and then maybe walk us through a bit of, of how that cup final went and the comeback that you guys, you know, had to battle back from. Yeah, so everything was not going right in there. Like, I, th- I think we lost to someone in the pool game. And, you know, we talked about it like, poof, we cannot – have this happen, like, remember the people back home, and I just told the boys, you know, this should be the last time we lose this weekend. This is the last time. It's like, starting tomorrow, we cannot lose. Like, we have something to play for, and it's bigger than us now. And when we arrived at, that, when we lost to summer, we arrived late at the stadium. We didn't like traffic, and we, we didn't even warm up. We got off the, we got off the car, turned to the change of machine, and Ben was so furious about that. It's like, what's wrong? He was waiting at the warm-up and we didn't show up at the warm-up. It's like, we just got caught. There was an accident on our traffic. And, you know, Ben said, okay, you can't control it. And, and, you know, we always said that when a plane crashes, 
it doesn't just straight away fall off the sky. It always something that's with maybe the right engine inside and the left engine then. So we, we always talk about that when something happens, you look back, so what went wrong on upper? And we talked about, oh, because we didn't encounter the accident, we were late to this, and you know that led to our, our plane crashing against someone. So we talked about it. We got to get back online, and we have something bigger to play for, and we're lucky enough to get into the final and play Australia. And the, I just remember the wind being strong, because I'm doing kickoff, and I, we kick the ball 10 meters, and it goes back towards our 10 meters. And I'm like, how do we control this? And Australia were off to a good start. And we talked about it in halftime. It was like, hey, we need something positive. And we, we just need to keep ball. Like, we really need strong. Make sure, we told them, like, make sure we're, make sure that you know that the wind is strong, you know, and make sure that we're close to each other. And, but don't let it stop us from playing our game. Because so I remember, like, we scored a try of Savi from on our own trial line. We stopped Australia and we threw it deep in our trial line towards Savi and Savi take it all the way. And, you know, we said that whatever happens, we'll hold true to what we've always said that, you know, we'll always throw the ball around and just make sure that we keep ball and let's keep playing. And then we got another turnover and we throw it to Talinga. Talinga was in space. Jerry stepped one, two and gave it to Talinga, Talinga, and Talinga scored again. And I think that just, you know, helped us pop us in front of Australia. And we held on to to win. And that was a very good Australian side. I think Quade Cooper was playing. Yeah, Quade was playing. And it was nice to play against Quade Cooper. And it was like, you know, uh, he's a really good guy. After the game, shook hands. And we always talk to him. Like, he always comes around and says, hey, boys. When we're sitting at the ca- cafeteria or in the hotel. And how are you guys? And talk and so it was nice to get that and nice to, to play against uh, someone that's known in 15s and, you know, to know that he's a, a really nice person. And let's talk about the, the Olympic Games and what the build like, build up was like. We've seen footage of your team running up the sand dunes and, and with limited resources and just a, a solution-orientated approach you guys had. <sighs> Robin and Dallin, I'm telling you, like, I don't care how fit you are, like that sand dunes will kill you. Like, I don't care how fit you are. How fit you think you are? You go up the sand dunes, I'd rather do squats in the gym all, all day than go to the sand dunes. Yeah. So we've, we've always, we had an eight-week plan, and every Friday we go up the sand dunes. Every Friday we got like, Friday morning, 4 a.m., everybody get in the bus, we're going. Like, we, on our way to the sand dunes, it'll always be noisy in the bus. Everybody's laughing, John. But on the way back, after we shower, lunch, and we come back, and we dropped the boys along their villages along the way. Like, everybody's just asleep in the bus. And as soon as he goes, like, yeah, we'll see you. Like, the bus is so quiet. That's how demanding the, the sand dunes. I've always said that, you know, I'd like to come up to the sand dunes and not run. Because it's so peaceful when you just sit there and, and you watch the sea and watch the surrounding and the sand. And I said, it's so peaceful. But I said, one day I'll come here just to sit down and watch. I don't want to run. Because every time I've come up here, oh, I'm always running. And I think that gave us an edge because yeah, the Senate was tough. And I remember I have a, having a video, was like interviewing Jared after. He's like, hey, Jared, how do, what do you think of the Senate? And Jared said, oh, I don't want to come here ever again. <laughs> and you know what? That, I think that if you can go through the Senate and it helps develop mental toughness in you, and it helped really get your legs to another level, like your calf, your thighs, your hamstring, like you just feel it burn. And going up the sand, at one stage, we feel like we don't want to run, we just roll down. Like we don't care about the sand, it's like no energy to run down. Just roll down and then call up again. Roll down, call up again, let's go. And at the end of the sand, we'll, we always sing after everything, and we always sing like we have overcame. Because I know that's, that's one of the toughest, toughest training that we ever go through. I, I, I would rather do 400s on the ground than do sandwiches. And, you know, we're lucky to have that in Fiji. And, you know, Ben put it into good use. And that was something that really gave us an edge at the Olympics. You talked about the gold medal at the start of this, this conversation. Well, you guys, you guys earned it. And you guys had already won it before you even showed up in Rio. 
albeit you had a few tough teams to, to face. And uh, one of the teams you topped in your pool was a close uh, close quarterfinal, or sorry, a close game in the quarterfinals against New Zealand where you beat them by five points. Can you tell us about facing your old rivals, the All Blacks, and uh, what it's like to play against the Kiwis? So to play against the Kiwis is always tough. Uh, New Zealand are always tough opponents, but Fiji and New Zealand have this long history in sevens, and everyone knows about it, uh, like rivalry in sevens. And to a Fijian boy, when he plays New Zealand, you don't have to inspire him. You just see, he just switches, switches on automatically. Because when you grow up, grow up watching sevens, like, all you can see is like, oh, all blacks are now Fiji playing in the final. Like, you watch all like, you know, in your mind, like, oh, they are the enemy. And you grow up always playing each other. So when you see Fijian boys, when they see a black jersey, they, you, they don't need to get inspired. They just switch on automatic. I don't know what it is. About, but I think it's the rivalry and the culture. And, you know, on other teams we'll play, sometimes we'd, we'd be off the mark with our mental focus. And, you know, Ben would get to us. Like, I don't care who we play. If it gets you switched on, if you see them, see them as a black jersey. If that what gets you switched on, see them as a black jersey, as an all black, and you play. Because he said, because every time I see you against New Zealand, I know I don't have to say a thing. Because I know you're already switched on, and you boys just lived against New Zealand. And, you know, back home people say, like, as long as Fiji defeat New Zealand, if, if, we, if we lose in the final, and, then, and they say, like, as long as they defeat New Zealand on the way, it's good we defeated New Zealand. Something like, you know, because... That's how big the rivalry Fiji and New Zealand have. And, and I always look forward to that to the games against New Zealand. It's tough because they test you. And they have set the standard for a long time in the series. And Dallin would know that. You know, they've won the series more than anybody else. And they set, and you would know, they've set the standard for a long time in the series. And so we've always looked forward to playing New Zealand. And just the rivalry, when you win against New Zealand, it, it gives you a sense of Sweden boys, like, you know, like, oh, we defeated New Zealand. Man. It gives you that sense of, like, accomplishment that you were able to defeat New Zealand, you know. Like, they are a tough team, and, you know, they've set the standard not only in sevens, but in fifteens, and, and they used to have a very good team, and they still have a very good team, and the, the talents they have is amazing. And playing them in, in Rio, we played, who did we play? We said, like, Oh, we played USA, and we if we defeated USA, New Zealand would come in. Then if USA won, then New Zealand would, would go out. So when we defeated USA, New Zealand came back into the qualifying in the Olympic. So we gave it, and we were like, you know, we have to win against New Zealand. It was so close, like so close against him, like tough. And I remember they were defending really well. We threw the ball around so many times. Like when I rewatched the ball, like I watched the offload we made. Like how many offloads we made in then we made a break, but their defense was just so good in that game. And I think they really wanted it to. And you know, everybody knows what they're playing for. And we know like if we get knocked out in the quarterfinal, and if we get knocked out by New Zealand, like our, our dream is gone. And it was like our four year journey is gone if we lose this. We won't have Ben came in and just before we went in against New Zealand and said that. You know, if you lose this, we don't have any medal contention. We're out against New Zealand. You don't have a medal contention against New Zealand, so we need to win this. So there's no if and but we need to win against New Zealand. So we were lucky enough to come back. We came back against New Zealand and we were lucky enough to hold on. And now when I think about it, I remember playing New Zealand, like at that time we were 12. 12-7 and there was a penalty outside the 22 on the far left corner and I looked up and in my mind it's like I just gotta go for goal like go for goal I get 15 and and I thought I was like if we miss then they still have time to come. there's still a lot of time to play and I was like let's step it let's play let's keep the ball in hand <laughs> like now when I look back at it I was like what if we hadn't turned over the ball from New Zealand the right decision would have to be to go for goal. Eh? Now, that's how tough it was. And they had some amazing, like, they had Akira Yowani, the Yowani brothers. They had uh, Pulu and Kaka. 
Mikkelsen, and they had a really tough team. And, and I want to say, like, we were just really blessed to come up with the opportunities and to finish off those good teams. Well, Oscar, what I will say is in 15s rugby, for me, as a, you know, being growing up in South Africa, the ultimate battle is against New Zealand. South Africa, New Zealand, 15s. But in 7s, it's always been New Zealand, Fiji. And uh, you talk about statistics. I remember looking when you guys played each other 100 times on the series. Fiji had 150 and New Zealand had 150. So that head-to-head battle is just unbelievable and epic that you were able to pip them in the Olympics. Yeah, that, that's huge. And I, I remember growing up, like, I, I hated the watching sevens. Like, I hated the, like, not hated, but I despised them all black. Like, because they always play, like, they defeat Fiji. And I was like, come on, man. I'd always want another team to win. So, in 50s, growing up, so that led me to, like, oh, I'll cheer for, for South Africa. I've always been in 50s, like, I'll, I'll, I'll cheer for South Africa. And my brother knows that I've always cheered in Tri Nation growing up. I like I want. Well, my brother was an All Black fan. I've always cheered for South Africa because that rivalry from sevens, watching it growing up, you know, in New Zealand, even like you know, I just despise like oh, I want a team to defeat New Zealand, and it went to Fiji. Like I chose another team, so New Zealand shouldn't win. It it's really nice for Fiji to catch up because I think we were left behind when New Zealand were dominating the series. I think there was a huge gap there, you know, that New Zealand were jumping in front between head to heads. They were so I. I always look at that stats. I was like, man, I hope we can post these stats, and you know, because New Zealand, New Zealand are way far ahead of us, and I hope we close it. And in a way, mentally, it gets you like, oh, we're head to head. They're fifty. We're fifty. Oh, okay, we, we you know, we can match each other. Now. No, you're you're absolutely spot on. So let's go back to that uh, next game then, right? So you guys advanced. You played Japan in the semifinals. I were loaded Japanese team, and you beat them twenty points to five. And then the final, Great Britain in the first ever Rugby Sevens Olympic gold medal. Tell us and talk through that moment, your mindset, you're about to run onto the field, uh, knowing that this could potentially be the first gold medal for your Pacific Island nation. Yeah, so the scary thing, uh, the scariest game I've ever played was against Japan in the semifinal. So, because I know, like, I know, I know you guys know too that when Fiji plays, you know, a team that doesn't really, is not really a threat, like we tend to look, lose focus, you know, our mental is like, oh, it's just, it's just Japan, or oh, it's just this team, like the boys tend to, you know, lose focus. So when, after we beat New Zealand, we went to the hotel, and straight as we get to the hotel, I've been just on the boys. I was like, we're playing Japan. I'm like, don't underestimate them. They are in the semifinal for a reason. So I'm all, I was on all night in the morning, I just was on, I was like, stay humble. Stay grounded. We play our game. Don't let don't let it get in your head that this is just Japan. Don't be too casual. And I was on the boys' case and I said, New, Japan defeated New Zealand. So they're in the semifinal for a reason. So that was one thing that got me really scared was, you know, the, I hope the boys didn't switch off mentally. Like, oh, we're playing Japan. This will be an easy game and we're into the final, looking forward to the final. So when we defeated Japan, it was a huge relief. Because when we played, Ben was like, okay, if we lose against Japan, we, st- we, we still have to play for medal. But if we win, we are guaranteed a medal. We are guaranteed a medal if we win, boys. If we win, we are guaranteed a medal. So we won against Japan. We came in and was like, so we are guaranteed. We are going to play for no And Ben tries to tell the boys, like, no matter what happens, we are guaranteed a medal. You're going to have a medal in the Olympics. And we were just sitting there, just taking the boys into music and the time coming up, just so relaxed, like, oh, we're in the fun with the boys, just so relaxed. But Ben said, you can see this ruthlessness in their eyes, like, they're so relaxed and laughing, but said, when I look at their eyes, said, you can see a sparkle in their eyes. And he just said, I just know straight away that, you know, we're in for something special. We're always on the A, there's two warm-up pitches in Brazil. One is A and one is B. So we're always on A. No, we're always on B. So when we come up for, uh, I don't know what happened, but maybe they were playing mind games. Great Britain supposed to be on A, but they were on B. And Ben looked up and said, like, hey, we're supposed to be. And, but they were already on our, on our side. And Ben said, oh, let it go. Don't worry. So we ran out and I see Great Britain warming up and they are just so focused, like just so focused. And we ran up like children being released for, recess or when you're told like oh summer's here 
everybody, no more school. And you just run out. And we run out laughing. Nakara just full of laughter and everything. And we're ready to go out. And, you know, I remember just standing, standing in the tunnel, kind of waiting to go out. And I looked around the boys. And, you know, you see those all just all smiling. And so I was like, okay. Before we always go in and we're in the tunnel, I always ask the boys, oh, there's a question. Hey, can I ask one question? Can I ask one question? If you can ask one question. And the boys would look around. Him. Yeah. And I would say, is it on, boys? Is it on? It's in English. And they'll go, it's on. So when the boys said, it's on, there's a loud on. In, and I just knew that, okay, it's on. And we're about to run out. Then Domalela looks at him and said, hey, one more thing. And we looked at him and said, keep smiling, keep smiling. <laughs> and you know, like that thing just gets to you. And there's a feeling of, I know the boys said that, there's, some, there's a feeling that we felt on the time and before we ran, like, you just feel like there's this joy inside you where you can't keep it in and you just want to smile like. And we run out and, and they play our national anthem. And for Fijian boy to play in the final and you play his national anthem, it's, it's, it's huge and people ask and comment, the boys get so emotional. I said, yes, because we remember of where we come from and our tiny little island, not just a little speck on the map, in the, and we are here at the world stage, applied to play for something big. And you think about your family, and you think about all the people that's been through your journey, and it just gets you emotion. Like, and you think about the people that you're representing. Okay, this is it now. And I said, okay, we just got in the huddle. I said, hey, this is it. And Ben told the boys, like, I just, no matter what happens, I want you guys to show the world what Fiji rugby is all about. And I was like, okay. So we were lucky enough to get the ball going and just, I don't know how you could have rewritten the script or rewrite write the script or something, but the ball just went our way and we were just on another level. And how, how did it feel scoring the first try of the game in the gold medal match? <laughs> Amazing to really... <laughs> You think about it like I didn't, you know, you can never play in this moment. But when the ball came out and I'm running and I saw the uh, Mitchell coming in tackling, my mind was like, I have to, because I, I knew Jerry was calling. He's like, if I go down, I pop the ball up to Jerry. But as I look forward, I saw the turn. And I was like, I'm going to make this. I can make it. So I just tried to push forward, like momentum will carry. So I just made sure that. I held the ball with two hands and put it down, and it's an amazing because like I just scored in the final of you know the Olympic, and it's the first try of the Olympic, and it's just huge, and it was so huge that I just told Vatimo, you kick because before the final, Ben was like, Oscar, you kick for conversions, and but Vatimo was no, you're supposed to kick, so <laughs> I think I was like, no, you, I was so hit from scoring, said, you kick, <laughs> you kick the uh, conversion, I started walking back and. So that's when you watch Ben on the second one. He's like, Oscar, you kick the ball for the conversion. <laughs> yeah, so it was something special. Oh, it's, it's amazing to relive it. And, and just talk about just the rest of the game. So you said you guys had a lot of flow. You ended up winning by, by 40 points uh, in, the, in the Olympic final. What was that like to have, have the wind at your backs, essentially the Fijian wind at your backs the entire final? Yeah, I think you can, you can never, like I told Del, like, you can never write that, and you know you pray you you pray for those perfect games. You now you pray for like you imagine those perfect games. Like, what if we got all the possession, and what if we just score, but come back, kick off, score, come back, kick off, score, come back. You know, and uh, Ben Ben was always saying that you know when we're on when we're on point, teams will be catching shadows. And you know when we're on point, and in that final, like we were on point, like mentally, physically. Spiritually, we like everybody was on the same page and the level of focus everybody was with. But we did it with with that and that we did it with a smile on our face, you know. It's like we still like, like we get to represent Fiji rugby and show the whole world what rugby is about and what Fiji rugby is all about. So but to have that to have that momentum and to have that wind behind the back, like you're saying, is something that coaches pray for, that you always get the bounce of the rugby ball and you get the momentum and you're up. In the final, you always want to be up two, three, four scores, but you know, to be up by 30 points at halftime, it's just something you dream about. 
Well, you guys were ready, and I, I loved I love Ben's approach, and and obviously your the the team's feeling around in the in the build up to to the Cup final is the work has been done, and I know when I coach teams now, especially at bigger events, but even with kids, it's it's just trying to get all the take away the pressure. We don't need to put more pressure on. If the job's been done, if the work's been done, you've already ran up ran up those sand dunes for for two years um, you don't need to add pressure on the players and go enjoy yourself. And I don't think people mind being beaten by Fiji and everybody loves to watch Fiji for that reason. You guys just always express yourself when you have the ball in your hand. I think that's important in a team. Just to let, let, um, especially in sevens when game week comes around is the coaches should have a feel of their players. And, and I know that both you and Dan would know that when you see that, you know, shit, oh, this is going to be a good game. When you know your players are, are relaxed, are well taken care of, and you know that they're on point, you just know this is going to be a good game. You know, you know that this is a good game. My players are ready. Yeah, and he knew you guys were ready. So he just let you let you run out there like kids and get it done. And you guys did get it done and, and brought home uh, the first ever medals in Olympic Games for Fiji. And, and, and obviously the first one was a gold medal. And you returning back to Fiji, what was that like? Uh, they had obviously parades. It must have been absolute mayhem on the islands when you guys arrived. It was crazy, man. Like, we didn't know what, because our phones were, they've taken our phones in and after the final. And when we, I, they gave us our medal and we came back to the hotel bench and to the, to the condominiums of the Olympics village and Ben said, oh, you guys should see what's happening in Fiji. Take your phones in. You know, we just went to his room like we got our phones and we just sat and just saw. You know, we were watching people during the game and it was like. And when the final finished, like the streets, cars just stop and people are running in the middle of the streets. And now uh, we're seeing videos of people in the market selling flowers. They leave their flowers and they are running with their flowers. You know, in the streets and people just leave work and just honking their cars and riding around and. You know, it's something special. And to get home, they blocked off the airport. We couldn't go through the, the normal entrance because we were, they said you had to go through another, uh, the back of the airport and the police were there. And we got in the bus and we went straight away because people were at the stadium in Nandi. Like there was just a whole lot of people. And, and these two women coming back from church, we I think they saw the bus coming and they just immediately ran in front of the bus and they started doing press up and we were laughing. I'm like, Oh, look at that. This is what it means to them. Like these two old women come and throw their back down and they just, you know, they're so happy and they just start doing press up and we're in the bus just laughing and they just start waving and, you know, blowing kisses to the team. And I was like, man, this is what it means to the people of Fiji and to get into the stadium and people are just trying to touch your hand and just, you know, touch something you say hi or just touch you and say thank you, you know, for for winning it for us. And it was so it was just crazy. And uh, I know that some people have those videos and I was like, you know, they should edit those videos and show people how crazy people went Fiji won the their first Olympic medal and you know, going in the bus towards our, our celebration at the capital. It was funny because people like children were running with the bus for one kilometer, two kilometer, just with their mm-hmm. with a at their hand with a flag, and the police escort was in front with the truck, and these kids would run and jump at, in the police escort truck, and we were at the bus just laughing at them. I was like, you know, you can't control these guys are happy, and it's just something that they know that they will remember with them, and I don't know words can explain it, but you know, I wish that I had. I had recorded all these things when I got off, just have a GoPro on my head and just, you know, so people can see what, you know, it really mean when I look back at it. It's like, I wish I had a, a GoPro or something and just had it on my, have it on my head and just see, let the world see what, you know, I am seeing the rugby world and how crazy these people are about Savage and about their country. Well, one thing's for sure, it's, it's, it's larger than us and, uh, you know, rugby is just a vehicle to help inspire people and motivate people and, 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 and open doors. And, uh, I'm sure, you know, one day, or there'll probably be lots of future Fijian athletes that down the road go, I remember being in that stadium and shaking Osea's hand, or I remember that moment. I know where I was in Fiji or in the world when I, when, 
when uh, when he scored or when when Fiji lifted that that medal and uh, and and that's that's the special part is 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 throwing gas on that fire and motivating the next generation and the next generation and and of course for your 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 young son when he grows up and uh, and fills your boots one day too. Yeah, that's it. But I I remember going I think last year going back home and playing touch and. We're playing touch and I see this some people in the park and there's a group of people that are drunk. And he starts calling me, hey, hey, Colin, sir, Colin, sir. Come here, come here. I thought like this guy is drunk. I shouldn't go. So he said, Colin, sir, I still remember in the Olympic when you slaughtered that drop ball from the corner against Argentina and then it leveled us. And I knew like that helped us. And he said, God bless you. And he walked away. And I was like, dude, like this guy still remembers that. And, you know, and we talked about leaving legacies and, and the young generations in Fiji, you know, we've left the legacy and show them that, you know, that you can achieve anything. If it's, if it's not in the Olympic, that you can achieve anything you want to. And us doing that in the Olympic, you know, winning an Olympic medal was impossible. Like people say it couldn't happen. And then it happened. And it happened during our time. And I'm so happy about it because we were able to show people in Fiji, no matter what you do, if you work hard, if you turn hard and you set your mind to it, you can achieve it and, you know, and talking about my son and I'm, I'm happy that, you know, I have a, a legacy and my son, I can share with my son. That's like, when I'm gone, I have a medal that will be there with the family, you know, can show this, show them, show my son that, you know, my dad did this, you know, and inspire him, inspire him. And I don't know what spot he'll take up. So I was like, you know, whatever he does, like I will support him. A hundred percent, but I'm hoping he would choose rugby <laughs> and follow in my and my footsteps. And you know, and I see now. I've always I'm always telling like, hey, you gotta be better than me, okay? Make sure, and I know you, you're gonna be better than me, and you're gonna do great things. And and I hope that that time comes around, and I'm still around to witness that. And yeah. Well, we'll have to relocate you to Canada in the next few years so uh, Kalina Sal Jr. can play for Canada. <laughs> Dallin might disagree. Um, but, yeah, no, uh, you know, big, bigger picture. I mean, I, 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 I talked to you in length last year just how, you know, your, your, your team's vision and your team's um, success story and, and the solution-orientated uh, approach that Ben took with you. Um, and all the challenges Fiji overcame to reach their success. And, and um, you know, the Mexican team that I work with, we modeled, we modeled our ambition after, after you guys and right to the point where I took, took these, the girls phones and, and thank God we won the world cup qualifier because I would have had uh, 12, uh, 12 angry, angry Latina Mexican women because they're all pretty young girls. Cause we had a bunch of our older senior players get injured and, and for a, an 18, 19, and 20 year old, uh, um, big city Mexican young woman to give up a millennial to give up their cell phone is, is pretty tough to do. But, uh, I told them you give up your phone for the weekend and, and, uh, and your phone will blow up on Monday and you'll get to enjoy, uh, the memories you make without your phone and, and, and forever, uh, you'll be, you'll be, uh, your legacy will be there. So, so they did that. Thank goodness. Otherwise they would have killed me. But, uh, yeah, you guys were a huge, inspiration for not only Fiji but also also Mexico as I've shared in the past but uh and and then obviously you know now you're 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 mortalized on a seven dollar bill um where where in the world is there a seven dollar bill but but Fiji what what is it like for you to be back in Fiji and to see your see your smile on the on that on that seven dollar bill uh it, it's huge and it's humbling when every time I see it, it brings back, you know, memories. And I've, we've always talked with the boys, like, you know, we need to, to write our name on sand and not, not on, on stone and not on sand. Because we said, you know, there's, there's been so many great Fijian Sevens players that have come and gone. You know, as like, we need to write a leg, like we write our name on stones. Like when the next generation come, like it'll never wash away. They'll see this like, oh, oh, those guys, you know, like what, these are the guys that did this. You know, and, and that, that is one way that, you know, people see that $7 bill and know that, you know, these guys are the guys that achieved, you know, something that wasn't possible for a long time. And to me, going back and seeing that and 
in the seven dollar bill and it just bring back a lot of memory and it's so humbling that you know uh our government will do something for the boys to remember them by and uh when they said that oh we have something to show you guys we, we didn't think they'd say it was a surprise and when they unveil it and it's a huge surprise and i, I remember just getting you know all uh swelled up with emotion and they asked me I ask, what does this mean I like you know it, it means a lot and especially not for me and the boys we play with like it means a lot for our families like you know that when we're gone from this earth they still a part of us you now they will be around them like, and to do that with a currency is huge and you know people ask me oh, okay is it a, just a member I said like, it's a real currency you can use it to buy stuff <laughs> And you know it's, it's good to to really have them. I hope, I hope they give you gave you seven hundred of them or seven thousand of them. Uh, I don't know. People have been taking a lot of them, <laughs> so I hope that we can keep some. And we used to come and just show show my family and my maybe if I have grandchildren. Oh, that's that's special, and I know that a lot of a lot of people I've spoken to that have been to Fiji, they always bring back the bill, and it's the one, it's your bill, your seven dollar bill. So when I when I one day I'm able to travel there with my missus, I'm gonna get that one as well. So Oscar, let's talk um, briefly about Major League Rugby. Um, the professional setup in America has received a lot of exposure and support. Um, what is your experience being like representing the Houston SaberCats? Uh, it's been amazing in uh, America, and just to get an opportunity to to play in America and, you know, to see how things go. And I know Americans love their sports. And I've, I've always told people, like, this is a really sleep, sleeping giant in rugby. And they say, why? I said, I come here and I see these athletes. I said, I see these athletes. I see these people walking like these people, seven foot, and doing gym and running. they so fast. And you see that in, in the NFL, in chill bus jumping. And I said, well, imagine if these guys played rugby from a young age. I'm like, these guys would be untouchable in, in the world of rugby and be a super and like, And they already, they have the, the resource and they have the source, you know, to have a really big rugby country and people just love sports here. And, and that's what, the so one thing I'm scared about America, it, it wakes up to that. And I know that they'll be, they'll be a superpower and and Major League Rugby and coming here and seeing how it has taken off. Like this year has been, although it's, it's cut short, like last year was comparative, but this season it's really gotten tough. And the team are starting to recruit big and to see that colleges are getting involved. And I know people think about that. They, they are going to include college players in the draft and as it's growing and, you know, and I hope I'm around when, America really takes this seriously and and competes with the world superpowers in rugby. But yeah, being Houston has been quite like home in summer hits. It's good. It's hot. And uh, we've enjoyed it. And the club, they've looked after us really well. And I've, I've worked with uh, some amazing people. I've you know, made friends with uh, a lot of the boys. And I've, I've been able to share my experience. I coach for the academy and, you know, see these young players, there's something I wanted to do is, is give back and, you know, being able to tell my story and share my experience and, you know, through this young boy going up in America, like, you know, there's another road you can take despite football. Like, you guys love it, you can travel the world and, like, you'll have, when, when you finish, you'll have friends all over the world, whatever sport, what, what, what other sport gives you that you know I know they've talked about rugby is different like you make friends with the other team like you make friends for life and I know I'm friends with Central Africa Central Africa like you know we're rivals in there but we talk now and then like after the game we'll see like hey how are you and you know I catch up and and I message Philip's name and and hey how are you how's the family and Tetamaki from New Zealand sevens and you know I was like, you have relationship with this people, like the sport of rugby, and I feel like it's so huge. You get to travel and you get to make friends for life. And and I hope that, you know, these young college students and high school students in America really take up rugby seriously. 
and you know see that rugby is one of the sports that you need to play to enjoy but it teaches you culture it teaches you discipline and most of all teaches you teamwork and and one thing i've told that like, you'll make friends for life that you'll never regret you know like speaking with Dylan and you now i played against Dylan now he's been a commentator and now you know like i this relationship like oh i i played against you They're, oh yes we played in you know we remember those times like we played and you guys won and like this kind of thing like you do, you you won't you won't get that in the nba where you have friends from like all over the world that you played against and they remember you you share these amazing stories and yeah so i really loved my time in uh, in houston and i hope it uh it continues and you know i just hope to be around in america starts to compete with the super rugby pass i love hearing your stories today and before we let you go let's say i what other advice would you give to young aspiring rugby players who want to represent their country and most importantly, follow their dreams, whatever they are? Yeah, I've always found it that nothing comes easy. And what I've always told them was that like, you, you, you have faith in that, oh, you have dreams and you have goals and you set these goals and dreams and you'll have distractions that come along. But I've, one thing I've always told myself and I always told the boys, like when we have those teams, we have a faith that it'll work. But you got to have that work hard ethic. So I've always told the boys, you got to be able to work hard to back up your faith in order to be successful. So whether it's in school, it's in sports, or whatever part of life you go to, one thing I've known along my journey in life is that you have to work hard. And you got to work really hard to get there and to the young ones that are aspiring to get to their goal. And, you know, nothing is impossible if you put the time in it and just make sure that you have the right people around you that can take you towards your goal. And on our four-year journey, we've always said that we have a straight line towards our goal, a white line. So if you feel like on your journey to your goal that you're starting to diverge a bit or going to the left or right a bit. Make sure you check yourself and you get yourself back into that straight line and you continue going. Well, I just want to say it's uh, not every day we get to speak to a gold medalist and an all-round legend, somebody with more steps than the Great Wall of China. A real honor to have you on the Rugby Heart Podcast. Thank you, Dylan. Danke. Hi, Danke. There we go. You know Afrikaans as well. Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast and catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there and we'll see you soon.